my Savior, He rescued me, take this life, deliver the vessel of your love, oh, Good morning, church. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Um, I've got two announcements. Firstly, today we have Pastor Isaac on drums. <laughs> so as Daniel says, it's a pastor parish band that you have this morning. And secondly, um, I'm not supposed to be leading worship this morning. Jonathan was supposed to lead. Unfortunately, he's come down unwell. So let's go to God in prayer as we welcome God into our presence and also to pray for anyone amongst us who needs prayer. Father, on this Friday morning as we gather in the house of the Lord, we remember your act on the cross. And your act on the cross and the blood that was shed gave us healing, gave us wholeness, delivered us, O Lord, and we claim, we claim on the blood of Jesus upon any of us who is unwell, who is in less than an ideal circumstance, perhaps a strained relationship. Or, a, or an overbearing boss. Or whatever it is, Lord, we just pray your presence into every circumstance. And we know and we believe that you are there, O oh Lord. And once again, Father, we give you thanks and we worship you this morning as the lamb, on the, as the lamb that was led to a sacrifice, but that powerful act on the cross delivers us. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, into this. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, into this place. Lord, we invite you, grant us your presence, O Lord, and be exalted as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you just rise? Today, some of the verses of the songs we're not singing. The whole intent of today's worship is for you to worship God for what He did on the cross for us, for dying on the cross. Sometimes at Great Good Friday, we sing songs that are still like it's Easter. We thought as a team, we thought for today, we'll just focus on remembering Christ on the cross, just for today. I 
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Cast my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed body bound, his body bound, drenched in tears, in down, in Joseph's tomb, in the entrance by heavy soul, Messiah
behold that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. So cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor. Let's do the chorus again. Hold oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor to Thee. Let's sing Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus silent as he stood accused beaten mocked Hands he turned into the Father's will. He took a crown of thorns and over the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out. So cries out, Hallelujah, is an honor to thee. Saint of heaven, God's own sin to purchase and
Church, as we stand in the presence of the Lord, and in the next song as we sing about the blood of Jesus, I ask that you picture the cross. Picture our Saviour Jesus on that cross. And the blood that He shed In church, while the blood of Jesus brings us so much good, the act of dying on the cross is nothing but a calm situation. It is intense, it is difficult, it is painful for Jesus. Oh, precious is the 
that again. Let's do the chorus again. We know our victory is in Jesus and our victory from the blood you shed. And Lord, remind us that even as we stand in your presence, it's not just for now that we experience your presence. It's not just now that we feel your presence, but Lord, send us out with your presence. Send us out, Lord.
Christ for our soul. Your name is worthy, worthy Lord, worthy Lord, worthy Lord, worthy Lord. I just want you to soak in this time, just enjoy His presence. 
enjoy His worthy presence. And He counts us worthy, worthy of His presence. He has counted us worthy, worthy to enter into His presence. He has counted us worthy. And He is here, He is here with us. He is here with us. We thank You, Jesus. We thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord, that we, You have counted us worthy, Lord. And Lord, we want to raise and praise Your name to the utmost highest because Your name is great, Your name is powerful, and Your name, Your name is Your name, dear Lord, that we're talking about. Your name that we want to raise up. Your name, dear Lord, that we want to praise continuously, Lord. It's Your name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray for someone here. Someone here. Someone that you've been, you know, you've been seated alone on your bed. You've been seated alone on your bed and you felt that all the world has collapsed because, you know, you have from you have came in a way from royalty. You are down to darkness. You are of certain high position, but recently you have lost everything. You have lost everything and you have come down to darkness. In a way, you are from royalty to darkness and you have lost all hope because you have placed everything, everything on this job that you have. You have placed everything on this work that you have. But now you have nothing and you have lost all hope. You find that there's no meaning in life anymore, but I felt Jesus is saying this to you. I felt Jesus is saying this to you. Only way for you to see what I'm doing in your life is to bring you out of where you are. Out from where you are. So that you can know my plans for you. And that's the only way for you to understand and see what Jesus has, has plans for you. The big plans that Jesus has for you. is to take you out from your high places remove you from there so that you can see what Jesus has in store for you. Great plans, wonderful plans, beautiful plans, plans that you will find hope, plans that you will know that, wow, it's none other than God's plans for you. It's not your own plan. You have never planned for this. And that's what I felt that the Lord is saying to one of you here. One of you, great plans for you. Don't think of it that you have fallen from grace. Don't think of it that you have fallen from royalty to darkness. But God is raising you up to His glory not your own glory but His glory His wonderful glory His great and wonderful glory thank you Jesus that Lord that may you bless this individual bless this individual to understand and to see your wonderful glorious plans for, for this person let, them, let it be no longer depression let there be no longer you know pain being alone crying alone on this bed but let it truly be raising of hands that truly be praises, praises to your glorious name, praises to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this person, Lord. We thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's one more person here you have recently lost a very good friend, a very close friend and it, it, it hurts and pains so much that you have lost this good friend. And I have this, I have this verse for you, Proverbs 18, verse 18. Proverbs 18, verse 18 says, An offended friend is harder to bring back than a fortified city. An offended friend is harder to bring back than a fortified city. This friend means a lot to you. But this friend is offended, offended by what you have done, what you said. The next verse is this. It's not in Proverbs, but this is what the Lord say, is saying to you. Forgiveness can bridge any river. 
Forgiveness can bridge any river. There's no river too wide that cannot be bridged. Forgiveness is the answer. Forgiveness and reconciliation. It's a time to say a sorry. It's a time to seek that reconciliation. Although an offended friend is harder to bring back than a fortified city, but Jesus is the answer. Forgiveness and reconciliation can draw all things together. No river too wide that God cannot bridge. There's no river too wide that God cannot bridge. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have given your words to certain ind individuals here. And to really pray there, Lord, that they will heed, they will heed your advice, they will heed your word, they will heed your direction, that they will follow clearly your direction. I want to pray for someone here now that, that, that you've been having sciatica, you know, sciatica, that, that this, this nerve issues on the back, and it's been, it, it's been terrible, especially in recent days. You couldn't stand up, you, could, you couldn't move much. Every movement is painful. In fact, every breath sometimes can be painful. I just want to pray for you. If you are the person, can you just lay hands to, on your back where it is, or you can just open your palms. If you're online, you can do the same. And just lay hands or just open the palms and let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord, you are God our healer. I want to claim your healing for this sciatica. That Lord, that there be no more pain. The sciatic nerves will be repaired. That you grant newness, newness to those sciatic nerves. That those nerves will be fully restored in your name. We claim it in the name of Jesus. We claim it that Lord, that the nerves be given anew. Because, Lord, you are God, our creator, that you are our God, our maker, and you can grant us new nerves, new joints, new ligaments, new bones. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. And we claim it now. We claim it, Lord. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Finally, Lord, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for your dominions in the world, that you are ruler of this world. There's no walls. There's no battle. There's no flood, there's nothing that's too great that you cannot solve. We claim your sovereignty Lord, that you are dominion over the world and Lord, that everything is under your care, everything is under your hands that Lord, we lift to you all these troubles we lift to you all these issues and struggles we know dear Lord that you're sovereign and we know dear Lord, we know dear Lord that you will put all things right and you make all things right we thank you Jesus and we claim it Lord, we claim it Lord because Lord, you are God our God our God, the Creator. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. And we pray all this, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, very good morning to all of you. <laughs> thank you for joining us for Observing Good Friday. Um, you know, this is a time that we want to welcome any morning new among us. You know, if you are here for the first time, first few times, or you have not been here for a long time, if you could just raise your hands so that we can recognize you and welcome you. you know, if you are new, our PMC, uh, the ushers will love to pass you our PMC package so that you can get to know us better. Is there anyone new? Yeah, just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Anyone? Oh, yes, we do have. God bless you. Okay, those seated around, okay? please do welcome them. Anyone here or this other segment here and the mezzanine? Anyone new among us today? Over here? Well, if not, okay, we're among friends and family. Remember, today, 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 Jesus died on a cross, you know, on Good Friday, we observe Jesus died on a cross for us because He loves us so much. So as we stand up to greet one another, just, just say, Jesus loves you. Shall we all stand and greet one another? Jesus loves you. I know it's a bit warm. Thank God for the, for the rain, just for a little bit. You know, it cools down the weather a little bit. Thank God for that. Well, you can continue to worship God by giving to Him His tithes and our offering. You know, there are two ways of giving via the QR code or the boxes on the aisles. Come, let's pray. Lord, we want to thank You that You have paid the price for us all. You have given to us Your life. 
that Lord, that you know, you show us what is giving. It is giving everything. So Lord, that as we learn to give, teach us also to give and understand to be a part of what you're giving because there's power in your giving of your life. And when we give, let us also give with your power. Let us give also with your love. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come, let's continue to worship God by giving to God. Shall we all stand to praise God? by Kibun to read for us today's scripture. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 17 to 37. John 19, verses 17 to 37 in the New International Version. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is in Aramaic, is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Glopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, 
So they soaked a sponge on it, in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day would be a special Sabbath. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, sorry. I think I have already overread. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Yeah, continue. <laughs> now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it, it, saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And so, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kibun. Morning, church. A blessed Good Friday to all of you. Now, what if I told you that I could, with 100% accuracy, predict what will happen to you tomorrow, including what you will be wearing? Wouldn't you be amazed? Well, for some, yes. For others, maybe not, because you already planned the whole week's wardrobe. <laughs> But what we have to extend that prediction to one year, to predict one year in advance what you'll be wearing and what will you be drinking. Wouldn't you be amazed by that? But let's extend it even further. A prediction of 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years. Wouldn't you be totally amazed that this prediction will come true? Well, today on this Good Friday, a story that many of us are familiar with, let's look at this familiar text from this angle of prediction and fulfillment. And that's why I entitled today's sermon, The Fulfillment of Scripture. We will examine this familiar text from this angle. Now let's pray before we begin. The Lord, indeed, you are the sovereign Lord, the one who has dominion over heaven and earth, and not just in this day, but really sovereign over history. And so, Lord, you have given to us your precious word, your life-giving word, a word that spans across generations and centuries, but caused that word to come alive once again as we hear this familiar story. It may be an old story, but it bring fresh new meaning, importantly, bring new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we heard the scripture text read for us earlier, so I wouldn't read it again, but let's dive straight in to examining the first phrase, the first time the phrase, the fulfillment of scripture was used and it's heard in verses 23 to 24, right? The soldiers said, right, let's decide by lot who will get it, and the scripture might be fulfilled. They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now, this is a fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 18. Now, if you have, uh, if you are digital Bibles, you can refer to it. Sometimes there are footnotes, you know, bracket A, bracket B, bracket C. Sometimes we don't click on it. But if you click on it, usually you can see uh, where that reference is from. But if you don't have a digital Bible, it, or you, you will look at our two Bibles in front of you. And in, if you look at this passage, they have a footnote at the bottom. It will refer to you the Old Testament passage where this fulfillment is uh, taken from. And in this case, it's taken from Psalm 22, verse 18. I put up for you the Greek text, not that you know Greek, right, for most of us, but you don't. But if you look at the squiggly lines and the drawings, basically what I'm trying to show you is that John's citation of Psalm 22 verse 18 is verbatim. In those days, uh, the lingua franca, the language, the common language that people spoke was Greek. And so they translated the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures into Greek, and they call it the Septuagint because it's done by 70 people. Lah. That's the so-called tradition. 70 people translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek to be used in those days. Just like for us now, English in Singapore is our lingua franca. 
we speak English, everybody understands it. The scripture is written in uh, English for us, but in those days, it's written in Greek. Now, Psalm 22 was written more than a thousand years before Christ. Imagine that. One thousand years before Jesus appeared onto the scene, they already predicted that the soldiers will gamble, cast lots, cast the dice, so that they will determine who will get which piece of Christ's clothing. And I think there's some kind of hidden irony over here. You know the die is cast. That's the sermon title Pastor Isaac preached some time ago. You roll the dice, right? The die is cast. But the soldiers forgot that actually one who controls the outcome of the die, how the dice, the lot will be cast, is God himself. And a thousand years before this even happened, God already knows which soldier will get which piece of Jesus' clothing. Now, isn't that amazing? Some people, unfortunately, use these verses uh, to justify that Jesus must have been rich because it was a seamless piece of garment woven in one piece from top to bottom. And of course, this is not unreasonable given that it's a high-quality piece of work, workmanship, and certainly maybe it will fetch a high price. There is one possible explanation. There is another logical explanation why the soldiers wanted the garment. Jesus, by then, was a very prominent figure. Almost everyone knows him. And if you have his clothing, you can sell it off for a great price. Sure, you won't want to do that as well. However, others suggested that the Roman soldiers weren't well paid and taking the booty, taking the things from those who were being crucified was simply part and parcel of their pay. It's what they did day and night. It doesn't matter whoever the person is, they needed money or whatever, See, they don't have it, so they would just take the clothing from uh, the criminals. And so Jesus' clothes really didn't be expensive at all. But we really don't need to speculate or detain ourselves with either way because that's really missing the point. The point, it really is the spiritual significance be behind the seamless woven garment. It's that spiritual significance that we want to focus on. And there are first two. The first century uh, Jewish historian Josephus stated in his book, uh, Antiquities of Jewish History of the Jews, that the temple's high priest was the one who wore a seamless long vestment, a long garment. And this is also a reference from Exodus chapter 28, verse 4, that Aaron and the Levites, those who are called to be high priests, they had a special attire on the Day of Atonement. They were to wear this long, woven, seamless garment in order to perform that holy work. Now, the thing we need to note, however, is that Jesus isn't from the tribe of Levi. He's not from the tribe. He's the descendant from the tribe of Judah. And so technically, he doesn't have that uh, authority to wear that linen robe. And so that really begs the question, why was Jesus wearing this seamless piece of garment? Second thing we need to note is that in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, after the completion of holy work in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 23, it says that Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and then leave it there. In other words, after he has completed the work, he's to strip off that long tunic, the garment, and leave it there to symbolize, hey, the work is completed. And so when we take these two um, passages and put them together, what John is teaching and highlighting to all the readers is that Jesus is the true high priest. Even beyond the Levitical priesthood, there is Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, in, in chapter 10, verse 21, it says that Jesus is the true high priest in the order of, the, of Melchizedek. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a time when Abraham... Right, met this king, King Melchizedek, and then he offered to him tithes. And from there, the Hebrews author says, this Melchizedek is higher than Abraham because Abraham worshipped this king. And so Jesus is of the lineage of the order of Melchizedek, means he's higher even than the Levites. And so from there, the Hebrews author says, Jesus is our high priest. And so what's the significance of him wearing this seamless linen garment and then putting it aside? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 declares that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God who made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so on the cross, Jesus took all our sins, our sicknesses, our punishment, our death. He took our place. That's the work, the high priestly work that Jesus completed. Can we say amen? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. And so with that, right, John Calvin wrote about this divine exchange. Christ was stripped of his garments, 
that He might clothe us with righteousness. And that's the concept from 2 Corinthians 5.21. His naked body was exposed to the insults of men that we might appear in glory before the judgment seat of God. If you're here on Monday, Thursday, Pastor Colin preached on this as well. The night in which Jesus washed the disciples' feet, his scripture records for us that he took off his outer garments and dressed only in his undergarments. It's also a prophetic sign of what will happen to him the next day on Good Friday, that he will lay aside this garment to fulfill the work that God has given to him. And so we praise God once again that Jesus has completed the work of atonement for all of us. Moving on, let's go on to the second time the phrase scripture is fulfilled, and that is found in verse 28, where Jesus says, I am thirsty, as we can see in the scripture passage. However, this time it is not a verbatim citation. And in fact, if you read the hard copy Bibles and the pews, you realize there is no footnote there. There is no footnote there. And so how then do we know that scripture is being fulfilled? Because that's what John says, right? So that scripture will be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. So what scripture is Jesus thinking about? Well, first, first passage is Psalm 22, verse 15. My mouth is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. The same psalm that was quoted earlier, Psalm 22. It's not directly stated, I am thirsty, right? But my mouth is dried up. <laughs> same thing. My mouth is dried up, it's, I'm thirsty. You lay me in the dust of death. Now, why did Jesus say, I'm thirsty? You see, immediately after receiving this drink, Jesus goes on to say, if you look at the scripture passage, after he took the drink, verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished. And so for a very practical reason, Jesus asked for a drink because he's so thirsty he cannot even speak. And so that drink refreshed him so that he can say these important three words, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, for those of you who know your Bibles a bit more, you know the details. If you read the other Gospels, you'll realize that Jesus had earlier refused this drink, this drink of vinegar, gall, and myrrh, and that's found in Matthew 27 as well as Mark 15. And in Luke 23, the soldiers mockingly offered Jesus wine vinegar, but at that juncture, they did not allow him to drink. But here, finally, several hours later, Jesus states very clearly, I am thirsty, so the scripture will be fulfilled. And also to proclaim that it is finished. And this time, though, the soldiers did give him some drink, and it's uh, a fulfillment of Psalm 69, verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Now, both these Psalms, Psalm 22 and Psalm 69, were both written by David, and David lived more than a thousand years before Christ. What are the chances of that happening? To know the exact drink, the clothes, what will happen to Jesus' clothes, and what will happen to his drink? And yet, and that is recorded for us in the wonderful Word of God. But like the clothes of Jesus, to ask about the exact nature of the drink, what kind of vinegar was being drunk and so on forth, is really to miss the spiritual significance. As mentioned, Jesus said, I thirst from the cross because he wanted his lips and his throat to be moistened to utter that one final victorious shout, it is finished. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross is a finished work of redemption, atonement, and reconciliation. Through Jesus' work on the cross, his sacrificial death, the Lamb of God paid our debt. We sang that song just now, our debt is paid in full. And Jesus has truly taken away our sin, our ransom is complete. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. The third fulfillment of Scripture comes in verse 36. Not one of his bones will be broken, See, verse 33, the soldiers came to Jesus, found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. And then verse 36, why did he not break his legs? These things happen so that scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Where is this taken from? You look at the footnote. It's Psalm 34, verse 20. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. I mean, why as a psalm writer would you think about writing about your bones being broken? <laughs> Seriously? You probably won't think about that, right? But yet, David, a prophetic sign of what is to come of the Messiah, wrote Psalm 34. But actually, beyond Psalm 34, if you read the footnotes again, they give you another two passages, and I have it here as well. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. It must be eaten inside the house. The eat here refers to the Passover lamb. Take none of the meat outside the house. 
do not break any of the bones. In Numbers 9 verse 12, they must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. Now, these passages written most likely during the time of Moses or just after that, it's more than 1,400 years before Jesus was born. Think about that. What are the odds of that happening? I don't know about you, but I like to cook. And as someone who likes to cook, I can tell you it's very difficult to cook without breaking any bone. Right? You try cooking without breaking any bone. And it's the whole lamb, even though it's a one-year-old, it's not a full-grown sheep maybe, but still it's not easy to cook. And therefore, it is a very a prophetic reason, not a practical reason at all, why God gave these instructions. In fact, it was the Passover, you're supposed to eat things hurriedly, and so the bread was unleavened, they can bake it quickly and then run away, right? But the lamb, they're not supposed to break any of the bones. It's not practical at all. But God had given a prophetic picture, the point that 1,400 years later, Jesus will be our Passover lamb. And really, that's the context we need to, I need to remind us of when it talks about uh, the Passover lamb. The context is this. You probably know your Old Testament stories. There were 10 plagues sent by God when they wanted to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And the 10th plague was the death of the firstborn. Right? The death of the firstborn. But God gave the instructions not just to his people, but even to the Egyptians because by then they had already experienced nine plagues. And God was merciful to both the Egyptians as well as the Jews. He said, if anyone wants to avoid the death of your firstborn, what you need to do is take a one-year-old lamb, slaughter it, and take its blood and paint it over the door frames of your house. And when the angel of death comes, he will pass over. <laughs> that is the meaning of Passover. It's literally, the angel of death comes, he sees the blood, I will pass over. I will not enter this house to kill the firstborn. And so when John writes all this, he has this in mind. Jesus' bones were not broken. It was not left overnight to tell us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so when we believe in the blood of Jesus, we put our faith in it, we believe the angel of death will pass over us as well. And we're talking about the second death, not the first death, we will all physically die, but that's the second death, right? The eternal punishment, and that's the second death that God, Jesus, will save us from. So listen again to John's account. It was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath, who will predict that, right? Except, of course, God. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. So John is the witness here. He's saying, hey, look, I saw it for myself. I'm telling you, this is what I saw. This is my testimony. I'm telling you so that you may also believe. But let's backtrack a little bit. Actually, there's no guarantee that Jesus' bones would not be broken. Correct? Because the other two criminals had their bones broken. So why, therefore, did Jesus uh, not have his bones broken? Obviously, he had already died by then. But why did the Roman soldiers break their bones? And here I need to explain a little bit how crucifixion really works. The idea behind crucifixion is to give you a slow but very painful way of dying. That's how crucifixion was designed. It would be a slow, excruciatingly painful process of dying. According to Kathleen Schleyer, uh, who holds a PhD in biology and chemistry, it is highly likely that the victim's feet were nailed through the tops as often pictured, you know, in uh, many depictions of Jesus on the cross. It is nailed through the top of the feet onto the wood. Probably the knees are flexed at approximately 90 degrees, and the weight of the body pushes down onto the nails, and it's the ankles, the heels, that really support the weight of the human body. So normally to breathe in, we use our diaphragm. Everybody breathe in with me. Breathe out. Okay, we'll do it two more times. Hopefully you can feel your diaphragm, huh? not just your lungs, but you can feel there's a diaphragm there. Right, you breathe in, and then you breathe out. In order to exhale, your diaphragm needs to press up, compress the air in the lungs, and then force the air out in order to expire to exhale the air. So what happens on the cross 
is that the weight of the body pulls down on your diaphragm. It pulls down on your diaphragm and the air remains there. It is not easy to breathe in this state. Your whole body weight is being put down on the cross, you're nailed there, your heel is touching the back of the wooden cross, and the only way you can breathe is to push yourself up in order to breathe out. Otherwise, you're always short of breath. And so the only way to breathe is to push your heel. To push up, very painful because you've got to press against those nails and just to breathe. Think about that. Every breath is slow and painful. But more than that, Jesus asked for the drink also to say other words. Luke's gospel records for us. One of the things that Jesus said was this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Against the pain, Jesus pushed himself up to speak those words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It is finished. And so, my friends, that is the extent that Jesus went for our forgiveness so that our sins might be forgiven. None of us can atone for our own sins. It's impossible because we're all sinners. We are imperfect. And that's why even in the Old Testament, they had to use a perfect one-year-old lamb. It is a symbol. And look, we need a perfect saviour who can die for us. So that's how much Jesus really loves us. I like how Melvin said, this Good Friday, we don't want to sing about the resurrection first. We want to just meditate on the work of Jesus on the cross. The work of Jesus on the cross. But it isn't, it isn't just Jesus who loves us. It is also God, our Heavenly Father. God, our Heavenly Father, who has prepared His one and only Son to do so. More than a thousand years of prophecies and this time, three prophecies. It is the Father who prepares the way and the Son who obeys. Let's close our eyes for just a short minute, a time of silence and reflection. I ask that we try to imagine for ourselves what it means for Jesus to be on the cross. The nails in his hands, the nails in his feet, and the need to push up on his heels to breathe and to utter forgiveness. So, Lord Jesus, even as we remember Good Friday, remember, Lord, I need how much you love us. The extent of your pain and suffering in order to atone for our sins. And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One last note about the heel. You know, as early as Genesis chapter 3, when, you know, Satan caused Adam and Eve to fall and then God judges Adam and Eve as well as uh, the serpent, God said to the serpent, there will be enmity, you know, uh, animosity between the offspring of the serpent as well as the offspring of woman. And it says there in Genesis 3, you, the serpent, will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Who is that referring to? Jesus. Jesus' heel was indeed bruised. Imagine every time having to come up, you are bruising your heel, the abrasion that is required just to breathe. But Jesus will also crush the serpent's head. So Genesis 3, the prophetic picture was already there, the prediction, more than 2,000 years before. Let's go on to the last and final uh, quotation. Back to the account, the soldiers wanted to check if Jesus was truly dead. They pierced his side. I mean, this is a very logical thing to do, right? If you want to test whether someone is dead, you, you pierce them. La. <laughs> if they're not dead, they will, uh, they will shout. Surely they will shout. But if there's no reaction, then of course the person is dead. But this is a fulfillment uh, in verse 37 here, right? Of, is it, we want to guess where it's taken from? 
Psalms? No, it's not. This time you read your footnotes in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. The prophet Zechariah wrote 500 years before Christ. This is the second temple period. They had already returned from exile. It's not as long as David's time, but I want to point out that it's a different author. Just as Moses was writing 1,400 years before, it's a different author from David. But all three of them gave the same prophetic picture that Jesus the Messiah would come. Let's backtrack a little bit to examine the flogging of Jesus and the effects of that flogging on him as he moved towards the cross. The Roman flogging uses this uh, tool called the flagrum, which consists basically of a leather, a braided leather tongs with metal balls and pieces of sharp bone, you can see in the picture, woven into or intertwined with the braids. Now, the balls are given there to add weight to the whip so that it's heavier when you whip it into the flesh. And then there are bones designed to cut into the flesh and to tear the flesh. So it's not like your normal caning, you know? Your normal caning, you just see the red things there, right? But then with the bones attached, you're pulling the flesh to tear it open and you can expose all the veins, and so obviously there'll be a lot of blood. The beating was so severe that many times victims would not survive in order to go on to be crucified. Since I'm not trained as a medical doctor, I had to consult a medical friend and discuss with him some uh, medical information that I got from websites like questions.org and so and so forth. I, okay, come, what do you think? Is this medically correct and so and so forth? And so I asked him as well, you know, why is there a mixture of water and blood? when Jesus was pierced, what was going through Jesus' body from a medical point of view? And here are some possibilities. Well, it is uh, very likely that the person who is being flogged will go into shock due to the severe loss of blood. And so the heart will definitely race because you need to pump the same amount of blood for, you know, even though the blood volume has dropped significantly. Otherwise, you will not have enough blood to your brain. It is very possible that the victim will faint due to low blood pressure, and we see that in the other gospel accounts. As Jesus was carrying his own cross, he collapsed. He wasn't able to do it, and so he got Simon of Cyrene to come to help him. This is too heavy. He got not enough blood in him. And naturally, in those states, even if he wasn't uh, losing blood per se, the fact that he probably hasn't drank anything since his trial, right? From the night before, he was betrayed, sent to trial, sent here, sent there. I don't think anyone gave him any drink. So both the loss of blood volume as well as not being able to drink at all probably made him very thirsty. And so all these accounts kind of collaborate. And because of the difficulty in breathing, especially especially trying to exhale, carbon dioxide will build up in the blood, resulting in a high level of carbonic acid in the blood. And so the body responds instinctively, triggering the desire to breathe. At the same time, as I mentioned, the heart beats faster to circulate available oxygen And this causes damage to the tissues and the capillaries begin to leak watery fluid from the blood into the tissues. And this may cause a buildup of fluid around the heart as well as the lungs. These are the medical terms. I hope it's correct, but my doctor friend says they are correct. And so this is one possibility. When the soldiers pierce the body of Jesus because there's this fluid, which is not blood, around the heart and lungs, when pierced, both the fluid and the blood flows out. According to my doctor friend, who also concurs with this website by Kathleen Schreiler, the way crucifixion works is primarily by suffocating people to death. Remember I showed you earlier how difficult it is to breathe? And so most of the time people die of suffocation or if you cannot breathe, you will die of heart attack because it causes damage to the heart itself because the heart is trying to pump blood so fast, eventually it gives up and gives way. And so Jesus could have died of suffocation or heart attack or both, I'm not sure. But it really doesn't matter. The main thing is he really did die for us. And depending on the time of death, if there were some hours later, there could also be a separation of plasma from the red blood cells. And so when you plant, pierce the body, at any juncture, you can have two fluids. Now, I took some time to explain the medical part of this, the scientific part, to show you that faith and science do not necessarily contradict, especially for the younger people in our midst. They like to pit science versus the Bible and say these two cannot agree. It's not true. They can be in agreement. But anyway, back to the main point. 
if we just focus on how Jesus died from a medical point of view, that's missing the spiritual significance. Just like the rope, you know, the seamless rope or the drink. If you ask the exact nature of all these, is to miss the main point. And remember here, John is a fisherman. He's not a doctor. He doesn't know all these medical theories. But he knows what he saw. And he saw very clearly as the eyewitness is a mixture of body, of the blood and water coming out. He is the eyewitness to the actual death of Jesus. And I took more time to explain this part is because when John, the, the uh, apostle, wrote the gospel, there was widespread belief and deception that Jesus was fake. He didn't really appear. He didn't really die. Because in their mind, God cannot die. How can God suffer and die? God cannot put on a human body. That's evil. But here in his gospel, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. And so when he wrote his gospel, he had the same understanding as well. He wants to tell everyone, look, Jesus really died. I saw it with my own eyes. There was blood and water flowing out of him. And so my point is the same. I want all of us to know that Jesus' death, his thirsting, uh, his thirst, his bleeding, all point to the fact that Jesus had a real body. And it's very important that we anchor our faith on this, that Jesus truly died. It is because Jesus had a real body that he can identify with us, our fears, our suffering. If he was only, you know, fake, not real, then how can we say that, Jesus, you truly understand how we feel, our loneliness, Right, Pastor Colin was praying earlier, but I had the same sensing as well. Some of us are feeling that loneliness. If Jesus didn't really experience life as we did, he would never be able to identify with us fully in our pain and suffering, our loneliness. His loneliness is the greatest loneliness of all. Because on the cross, he was separated from his father, the father whom he had known for all eternity. But on the cross, because of our sins, he was separated for the greatest love of all. Not for his own wrongs, you know, but for our wrongs. And secondly, the fact that Jesus died, truly died, means that he can make atonement on our behalf. If Jesus only appeared to die, but didn't really die, it means we are unsafe. It means that God has in fact conjured up this elaborate scheme of deception to bluff all of us, you know. <laughs> and if that's the case, that is the greatest lie of all. If Jesus didn't really die, then God has set up everything to be a lie. We should all balik kampong, no need to be here. But that's not true, because Jesus, uh, John testifies that Jesus did die, and we know that Jesus is 100% God, 100% human. And because Jesus is perfect, therefore, as we have sung earlier, nothing but the blood of Jesus can be our perfect atonement and sacrifice. So let me summarize as we close. The scriptures have predicted, prophesied accurately for a long period, 500 years before Christ to 1,500, 2,000 years even before Christ regarding the details of how the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would die. Now, isn't that amazing? <laughs> isn't that amazing? Looking back, how scripture is being fulfilled, what are the odds of that happening? And as I mentioned, these scriptures were from different biblical authors, not just one person. How would so many different people be able to know one thing, right, about this one person? And so the conclusion is, therefore, it can only be God. But let's try to look at things from God's point of view, standing at the start of creation, before creation even came to pass. Now, God already sees everything, and He puts in place this plan, this amazing plan of salvation, so that eventually there will be salvation for all. Think for yourselves, if you were to plan for a simple birthday party, you will take probably one, two weeks call the restaurant or set up or buy the things for your house, whatever, right? One, two weeks to plan. If you were to plan for a wedding nowadays, eight months to 16 months, <laughs> depends on how, you know, how big you want the wedding to be. The fact is that we take time to prepare for something major. How major is it from God's point of view? 2,000 years of preparation. What kind of preparation was required? But that's what God has done to plan the greatest rescue and salvation of all time. It's important to also recognize that these fulfillments of scriptures, as testified by John the Apostle, reveal that Jesus is both our high priest as well as our Passover lamb. He is the one who intercedes for us, but he is also the one who makes the sacrifice for us. 
and that Jesus, he's perfect, he's without sin, and yet he suffered and died for us. Just again, remember the cross, the extent of suffering that Jesus went through for you and for me. The flogging, the crown of thorns, the excruciating pain of crucifixion, the pain to even breathe, and then to utter those important words, it is finished. All of it was done to reconcile us back to our Heavenly Father. So what then is our response? I think there is only one response, and it is back to worry. <laughs> worthy of it all. Right? Worthy of it all, what God has done for us. And so the proper response really is, thank you, Lord. And we worship not only with our lips, but with our lives. Let us pray. Lord, on this Good Friday, we thank you for bringing to mind the Word of God, the wonderful scriptures prophesying for thousands of years of the Messiah, and that it's all been fulfilled. And that tells us, God, you are a meticulous, detailed God, but Lord, indeed, you are a God who plans, the God who plans for our salvation because you love us so much. Jesus, we want to praise you also. That though you know the plan, you did not string back. You submitted to the Father's will. Though it's painful, yet you learned submission. You demonstrated obedience. All because, Lord, you love us and you love the Father. And so on this Good Friday, Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, you will teach us what it means to obey and worship you. Not just with our lips, but with our whole lives, Jesus. Let us follow your example. sorrows land of God by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor unto me. Sent of
my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, then the sun sets free, no is free. Now my debt is paid. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious that my Jesus knew. that you paid you paid for us all that our sins are washed and cleansed it is you you paid it all for us and that's why dear Lord we have life now and not just life but life eternal with you so thank you Jesus that Lord that you have paid the price for us at the cross at your cross you paid it all you paid it all for us. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that, Lord, all these are the fulfillment of the Scriptures. All these are the fulfillment of the Scriptures, dear Lord, that, Lord, everything came to pass because, Jesus, you obeyed and you went to the cross for us. Because, Jesus, you followed, you followed what you was instructed by the Father and you went to the cross for us. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your power. We thank you, dear Lord, for your obedience. We thank you for your great love, your mighty love, your wonderful mighty love for us. We thank you, Jesus. Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. And we pray all this, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. We will not be celebrating Holy Communion. No, we'll be observing Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday. And you can see that the altar has been stripped so to observe, observe that Jesus died for our sins. But on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter on Sunday, we will celebrate together the power, the risen King, the risen Lord. Because when He rises, we will also rise with Him. Lord, we thank You. We thank You that, Lord, that You have fulfilled yeah, your, your promises, that all promises are fulfilled by You. We thank You, Lord. In Jesus, we see, dear Lord, that Your love for us. In Jesus, dear Lord, we see, dear Lord, that you have given us everything. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, please be seated. If you do need prayer, do come forward. We'll love to pray along with you. God bless you. See you on Sunday.